welcome back to the mystery theory. Today we're going to talk about an army veteran related case that um, it was initially a cold case or an unsolved mystery but later on we learn quite a few disturbing things and uh, that's what I'm going to share with you today. Now this case, just as a warning, it does involve the use of drugs, the PTSD that this uh, guy was suffering, and if those things are sensitive matter to you, if you experience those, if they affect you, maybe this won't be the case for you. So. Just a little something before I start this video. Now, today's case is about Chase Tyler Masner, who was born on September 4th, 1987. We do not have a lot of information about his childhood, at least that I could find, but he uh, was born to a younger couple. Corbin Masner, his dad, and Stephanie Cadena, the mom. They didn't stay together for that long, so they separated when he was pretty young. And the only one thing that we can find in his record as a younger boy was an arrest when he was 18 years old. This was in August of 2005 where he got charged with some kind of a drug-related thing. However, they were later um, dropped, so he could actually join the army, and that was something that he really did want to do. He had to go to Iraq. When he came back, he had to deal with a lot of PTSD, However, he ended up meeting his wife, Amanda, around that time. They got married and they had their first daughter, Sydney. After some time of their relationship, they started to have a little bit more problems. I don't know what kind of problems. Um, later on, they'd say that it was more related to money problems but in, in the beginning they started to argue a lot and instead of continue the argument he would go to his mom's house who would mediate the situation or at least would let him stay for a night or two until things cooled down and it wasn't as explosive as it would be if they continued to work through that argument over the next couple of days so it did work out for them that way but uh, um, i wonder if that's a healthy thing I, I i read that he had the perfect relationship with his mom and i'm sure he did and i'm sure this is you know the way that was showing how much he loved him and everything but I'm not talking about mother and son relationship. I'm talking about having somebody, no matter who, kind of uh, mediate a very tough fight or argument that they continue to have over and over again. Um, that I found a little bit interesting, but just so you know, in the house where... Um, Chase lived with his wife and kids. He also was helping out his dad. Um, his dad was let go from the trucking company that he worked at and he was giving a hand to his dad. However, um, they still had money problems themselves. So I'm, I'm assuming that that was kind of a stressor as well. But 
something that is not really explained a lot. After he was discharged from the army, which by the way, it is ex speculated that it was because of some catbacks that they had to do, nothing to do with his behavior or any kind of direct problem with him. But after he um, was discharged, he was having a really hard time to find a job that would work for his needs or his family's needs. So finally, um, the wife got pregnant again. And at that point, he decided that anything was going to be okay as long as he could you know, continue to pay the mortgage or the rent. Um, I think I think they owned the house. They were making payments on a mortgage, but um, it's kind of uh, it, and I'll go that into detail because this is a perspective from somebody else. But um, this place it was called the Quick Trip, and I'm assuming it's a convenience store that it's very popular in you know maybe the area because it was referred as the quick stop uh, the, the quick trip uh, almost like a 7-eleven kind of thing in the nation well maybe that's more for the area however this place required him to work at night and it was about 13 miles away from his home yet he had a very close friend that lived a mile away and his name is Brad Clement. Now, I'll talk about Brad later on, but I just want to give you a basic idea of what we are dealing with from the beginning. About the home that they lived in, I was listening to this podcast where the guy was saying that he lives somewhat close to the area where Chase was living with his family and that his home was one of those um, not only nice looking but it was also in a very good neighborhood and that according to record it's kind of interesting to know how he could support his family and make payments on a house that is relatively expensive um, and nice with the paycheck that he got. Now, this is not saying that he was doing some other kind of business or something illegal to supplement whatever he was not making, uh, but it, it's one of those things that has been said that it was interesting to know that he lived in such a beautiful house, in such a beautiful neighbor neighborhood, yet he didn't make that much as a manager in that place where he worked. On March of 2014, the fights with his wife got worse and worse. So at this time, the mom, Chase's mom, I should say, would be more involved in their relationship to the point that at one time Amanda called Stephanie, Chase's mom, and explained how much trouble they were going through and um, trying to also see if there was any way that she could help. Stephanie, I think, gave her the idea or at least agreed with the idea of Chase staying with her for a couple of nights. So on March 26, um, Amanda got the kids in the car and went to pick Chase up from his mom's. And the kids were excited to see their dad and I think that after the cool down period that they had, they were ready to talk about what the issue was. The problem with that was that they started arguing as soon as they left the home while they were still driving to their home and Amanda claims that she dropped Chase off at his job. Um, this would indicate that um, 
not only the fight started immediately after leaving, but also that it was heated enough that Amanda decided to drop him off. There are some accounts that claim that really she kicked him out of the car no matter where he was, maybe somewhat close to his job, but really there's nothing that would indicate um, by a camera or by footage or a witness that would specifically say that she did drop him off at his job. However, this is all hearsay because the last thing we know with a witness is when he left his mom's house, which was the last time that she saw him. The rest, the driving back, the fighting, the dropping him off there, it's all what Amanda told the police once he was reported missing. Okay, there's no proof of this, there is no evidence, there is nothing, it's only her word. But apparently, he decided to walk to his buddy's house, Brad. Remember, I told you that he worked about um, a mile away from Brad's home. This was in the town of, is it Kennesaw, Georgia? And um, this is a small town about half an hour. To the north of Atlanta. I just had to look at my notes so I don't say something completely different. But um, this guy Brad worked on computers and he worked from home and it was also later said that he had some time of a job or some some kind of a job with T-Mobile. I don't know if it was working from home something he was doing on the phone I am not sure but just so you know this is the kind of guy that would spend a lot of time at home now Brad later on said that um, Chase showed up at his home then that's gonna be changed and changed because again we're going by, by what other people is saying that happened that day but really um we have no evidence so he was allegedly walking to his home when he got there they started talking and uh, Chase explained the troubles that he was having with Amanda and apparently Chase was very very upset so according to Brad they chilled outside um, they were trying to just talk over things and he was trying to help a friend who was struggling. It is also said that Brad tried to help Chase by texting Amanda from Chase's phone and inviting her for a barbecue at his home. You see, Brad was having a a roofing company work on his roof of course and uh, he invited them that following day to have a barbecue and um, he thought why not invite Amanda and that way we can kind of help the I don't know how that was going to help to be honest with you I don't understand how that was going to help but but um, he thought that it would be a good idea to kind of talk things over maybe a barbecue at his home so he did invite Amanda but he did it from Chase's phone now according to Brad they spent the night there and the next morning, Brad had to go deliver a computer that he was working on the day before. Um, and uh, he not only went to drop off the computer, but he also took the uh, Chase's phone who had his wallet. Apparently, I don't know if he used his phone case as a wallet or if it was more of a... 
I don't know, some kind of wallet with a case. I am not sure. But he said that he took them both so Chase wouldn't leave and be present for the barbecue that he was going to do that afternoon. Came back home and Chase was still there. So he decided to go again grocery shopping for the big barbecue that they were having in the afternoon. Brad said that when he came back from the grocery store, he started to clean things up and get things ready for the barbecue. One of the things he did was uh, turn on the barbecue and apparently he had a little accident where he set a small portion of his backyard in fire. So it was on fire and he was a little bit... um, panicking about it but he was able to manage it and when he ran inside to tell Chase about it Chase left so at that moment he decided that he was going to call Chase and apparently and according to him he took his phone after he carried the phone around all day so he wouldn't leave and uh He left a voice message saying, Hey, where are you? The roofer saw you leaving the house and I was wondering where you are. Now, I'm going to make a pause here and say that even though he did leave that message saying that the roofers saw him, that wasn't 100% true because once the roofers were interviewed they said that they did not see him at all that day and I'm talking about Chase Um, it's kind of interesting to make that statement over the phone like the roofers saw you leaving when the roofers didn't even know that he had a company in the first place so that was a big 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 red flag for the police immediately but that just so you know that wasn't true what he said and i saw even a few uh, screenshots of social media from the roofing company saying we had no idea he had company we didn't see anybody there now in the neighborhood nobody spotted chase and this was in the middle of the day Brad later on said that he assumed that Amanda picked him up um, and he wasn't too worried about it. Yet the family knew that he didn't spend the night with his mother. and He didn't spend the night at home and that wasn't like Chase. So they were already looking for him while Brad was assuming that he left with Amanda. Now, when they reported to the police and it was under the category of voluntary departure because of Brad's testimony that he left by himself. And um, he also mentioned, Brad mentions that he was so upset that he was talking about living a life in the woods, scavenging and kind of leaving behind his home, his life, and trying to find a very peaceful way to live. The police did know that he had his debit card and that he had his phone, apparently, but they could never find the phone. And the debit card, the last time that was used, was the night before when Amanda dropped him off at his job. That was the last time and it was for a couple of bucks, which could have been soda, candy or something like that. Now, Amanda at this point becomes a person of interest to the public because there are some interviews where she says that she dropped him off somewhat close to this workplace. There are others that said that, you know, she dropped him off at the place itself and according to Chase's mom she said in I don't know if she said it to her or to who that she did in fact drop him off at house could this be a misunderstanding absolutely 
maybe he meant, I mean, she meant that she was going to drop him off there because he was going to go to Brad's house. Uh, but the public really started to wonder about Amanda and Brad because both of them look very, very suspicious. Something interesting, I found interesting anyways, is that uh, Brad made a statement saying that Amanda visited him the next morning and that she was flirting with him, trying to get back at Chase for leaving her. That is his word against her word, but I found it interesting that he would add that kind of information that you wouldn't think it's as relevant as he thought it was enough to share it. Now, in an interview that um, it's called, it, it, it's a veteran group that was helping with the search of Chase, Amanda said that Chase was struggling with marijuana use and he was also struggling with um, heroin, okay? So, the, 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 the PTSD, the mental breakdowns that he was having, it was a bad thing, but then on top of that, for him, it was a bad thing, but on top of that, the abuse of drugs, it was something that it was known by Amanda. Just to add to this theory, later on, Brad gave an interview with Nancy Grace. I think this was over a podcast. I read about it. I didn't listen to the podcast itself, but Brad did say that they smoked marijuana that night when he, uh, when Chase went to his home, and also uh, that he was looking for Roxy, which is short for Roxycodone, um, which is a pain reliever. I'm always assuming that the codone at the end is a pain reliever kind of thing, but I had to look it up just to make sure that that's what it was. And the interesting thing is that apparently Chase was looking for drugs and he decided to go to Brad's house. I'm not saying that the guy was doing something fishy. Maybe he consumed them, but then when he talked to Nancy Grace, he said that he's never done them, that he had an injury once, and that he took the pills and they were horrible. And But it's interesting to see that, you know, when he wanted drugs, he went to see Brad. Maybe a coincidence. Maybe because he felt safe telling this kind of things to Brad. I am not sure. But Brad also said that he gave Chase $60 before disappearing. So maybe Chase didn't have enough cash. I don't know what the deal was, but just so you have an idea, some drugs were related to that night that he disappeared. After some time looking for Chase, Amanda had to move and decided to go to Iowa to be closer to her father-in-law who finally moved there after finding another job. Um, she was being accused of a lot of things that she felt like it was affecting her daughters, and so she decided to move away and start a new life. Now, Amanda does still look kind of interesting in the public eye, and Brad as well. However, neither of them have never been a suspect for the police, something that you should know. This is more about theories that people had on the internet and media than what really evidence they had against them. Eventually, Brad couldn't take it anymore and he decided that he was going to sell his home, which by the way, it's a very nice home in a cul-de-sac, um, beautiful neighborhood. He decided to sell it and move away. He kind of disappeared, went off the grid Nobody knew where this guy was for quite some time. Again, remember that this used to be a cold case. But before 
He actually sold the house. Some neighbors reported that he had a dumpster. Remember, they were working on his roof, and so he had a dumpster there, and they wanted the police to go through that dumpster. However, it was already in the landfill, and it would take hundreds of thousands of dollars to go through it, and I'm not exaggerating. That is the number that I read several times of how much money it would take in order to go through that dumpster and neither the family or you know the authorities had that amount of cash to go through that dumpster. And that kind of made Brad look worse and worse. He was enduring a lot of um, internet hate A lot of, um, you know, the people in the area knew who he was and what he could have done to chase um, the lies that people believe that he told. So that is why after the whole thing, they decided to, well, he decided to move away from the neighborhood. Now, I also found interesting a phone call that Brad had with Amanda. This call happened at 2 a.m. in the morning and a few things were discussed during that call and a few things were implied during that call. Number one, the fact that according to Brad, he gave $60 um, to Chase uh, because he was looking for drugs. It was also implied that Chase was having some kind of a meltdown maybe a crisis related to his mental issue and um, it was also mentioned (laughs) that he was planning to run to the woods and kind of live his life where nobody could find him. One of the last things he said in that phone call is, Brad said, is that he would never let a friend overdose at his house and that he would know what to do if that happened. I don't know, I found that a little bit eerie, but again, there is nothing at that point that would give the idea that maybe something like this happened. There's no indications, there's no proof, there's no evidence. So again, this was a cold case for a few years. But then on July of 2017, cadaver dogs picked up the scent and the backyard of what it used to be Brad's home. So they had to dig it up. They found a body. And initially they didn't tell the public if it was in fact Chase's body. But they did an autopsy and they determined that it was Chase's body. (laughs) At that point, after they confirmed, and this was in August, of 2017 that it was confirmed that it was Chase's body, Brad told the police that he was going to turn himself in the next day. He never did. He started running and uh, the police found it interesting because just a week before, he said on um, some kind of a show, he said that somebody was framing him for Chase's death. So the police thought, well, if he is voluntarily coming to the police station, maybe he can help us understand why he thinks he's being framed. But he ran uh, for a few weeks and he was finally found. The the van where he was running away um, was spotted in this parking lot and he was finally arrested. Now, just so you have an idea, Brad's life completely changed after what happened to Chase. He was charged with forgery, using a fake name, and possession of heroin. While, you know, in in the time between when Chase disappeared and the time that he was caught. He explained in the podcast with Nancy Grace that his cha- his life changed forever. 
that he could never have a normal life again and that he was being a victim of this thing that happened to Chase. But he was paying it with basically his life and he didn't put it into those words, but he explained how all the hate and suspicious and, and people on the internet changed his life forever. And maybe, maybe he did um, get affected to that point, but later on we learn that after he was arrested, he uh, pled guilty to one count of concealing death and making a false statement. Uh, remember, this was in 2017 and Chase disappeared in early 2014. So he had three years that he lived in hell, basically, because of how, how it changed his life forever. The body was... Um, wrapped in black tarp and a lot of duct tape um, he was so decomposed at the time that they found the body again three years later that they couldn't determine the cause of death but um, he did get 15 years in prison eight of them he has to be in prison and the rest can be on parole uh and then a thousand dollars so when i was doing the research for this i thought well let me see what he said that happened and i just couldn't find anything i'm assuming because of all the information that we have on this case is that they did in fact go and buy drugs or maybe brad had the drugs and that chase overdose and he concealed the body that is the only way that i think he would be charged for with one count of concealing a body and not murder itself uh, again the other count of making a false statement i mean those are things that of course are not related to murdering somebody so it, again, it's kind of interesting to see that in the end, maybe we don't have, or I couldn't find, it's not available or readily available for me to find that information because maybe this was an overdose and it's one of those things that they try not to um, talk about too much. So after years of being a cold case and having no evidence and i wonder why they couldn't find the body before i mean you can tell when there's disturbed soil there's machines there's things that will tell you just like you know the watts case um but i wonder why they've never done it before and what happened that they decided to do it later on that's one of my questions and it's such an overall sad case because um, this was a young guy uh, he was having a family and uh, two young daughters and even though he was trying to make things work things were not okay in him he was dealing with that PTSD. He was having trouble with his wife. He was having trouble finding jobs. So money was tight. So maybe he did started using some kind of a substance to fill himself. But uh, I don't understand this Brad thing not reporting what he saw or what happened that night if he didn't have anything to do with it was it because maybe he had a small business in his home and he didn't want to get caught for that was it because i don't know i wonder 
why didn't he report it? Why didn't he call 911 and say, hey, my friend overdosed in my house. And he took the chance to bury his friend in his backyard. Leave his friend's wife and little daughters to be scrutinized by the public. Enough that they had to move away. That he dared to say that Amanda went and flirted with a guy just because she was mad at Chase leaving her. Kind of pointing fingers at other people when you do know deep inside you are the one responsible behind this disappearance because he may not be responsible for the overdose but he is responsible for concealing that body he's your friend he's your buddy he's your he's he has a mother he has a father people looking for him yet he decided to bury him So the only thing I can assume that he had something in his house that he didn't want to be, uh, he didn't want the police to find. Or maybe the, he didn't want the police to be digging around his stuff. What was he hiding? Why did he do it? I have no idea. But it's interesting to know that Chase went for him or went to him to find drugs. So please, leave your thoughts down below. What do you think happened to him? Did you find anything else? Do you know about this case? Maybe more details that I couldn't find? I would love to know what you think about this and uh, why you think that Brad acted this way instead of reporting the overdose of his friends to the authorities uh, or his friend to the authorities and maybe even save his life such a tragic um, case and uh, you know last year I was at my oldest son's um, graduation and I remember you know the principal asking Stand up if you're enlisted in the army or if you're going to whatever, Marines and Air Force. And, and I saw so many of those kids that I saw grow up. Um, I used to be the assistant for the teacher in 4th, 5th, and 6th grade for my oldest. And... Uh, I remember those names, I remember the little faces, you know, the grades, the ones that always turn on, turn in the work, the ones that never did, the ones that would make a smiley faces in the spots that they didn't have the answer. And I guess my mom's heart is always worried about those kids, you know, because they will become something different and I'm not saying that it, that's bad that's a good thing but when you hear these cases and you see how some of them cannot deal with it, it and when you read about these cases enough then I am happy for them because that's they cho what they choose to do and but you just can't help but hope or pray that they will be able to deal with the things that they have to do when something like the Iraq war or a conflict that will change their lives forever. And again, I'm not saying that the army does, or the marines, or the air force, or I'm not saying that they are responsible for it. I am saying that we're living in such a twisted world that 
we are pushed in a way to different conflicts and those are the things that change this boys and this girls and this new generation that is enlisting it's not the army it's not the air force it's not the marines it's not all the different branches of our military but it's the conflicts that we're leaving and the measure the measures that different countries have to make or take in order to I don't even know what the point is but I guess the bigger picture is the freedom so this year when I go to my second oldest son graduation I'm sure I will see more of those brave kids 18 year olds that are already enlisting and I guess I can't help it but to say a little prayer for them to keep them safe wouldn't it be amazing that our military wouldn't need to see those horrible things that some of them have to or maybe that would be my little prayer thanks for being here today guys I appreciate each and every one of you I'll see you back here next Friday for a whispered true crime case bye guys